This is ATN Presents on the same page. Today, we're on the location at the Arkansas Studies Institute during the Arkansas Literary Festival where we talk to Wells Tower, author of Everything Ravaged, Everything Burned. Stay right here for our interview with Wells coming up. Here's the book, Everything Ravaged, Everything Burned by Wells Tower. And Wells, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it at the Arkansas Literary Festival here. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Congratulations on the book. It's, it's getting uh, rave reviews. I think the New York Times now has a policy that it has to mention it every day. <laughs> <laughs> they've, been, they've been very kind. What's that been like to put out a book, your first collection of short stories, and, and to, to uh, see such positive reaction from it? Well, it's, it's interesting. I kind of imagined that, I mean, knowing what I know and have heard about the way short story collections are generally received in, in the United States, that really my greatest hope for it was that it would be ignored and would sort of fade into obscurity without being uh, too drastically eviscerated by the critics. So, <laughs> uh, the fact that they seem to be uh, liking it has, has been a bit of a surprise. Yeah. But it, it's, it's been affirming. It's been, been great. The, there are nine stories in the collection? There are. And, and they've all been published elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But um, you didn't just pick them and say, here, take these. There was a lot of work that went into revising these before they were uh, published in book form. Is there that, was, yeah. It, it was an interesting process. I'd, w when the manuscript was bought, there were, I think, another couple of stories in there that, that were part of the original manuscript that when I got back, I looked at the pages and just thought, this is really, really awful, and there's no way that this deserves to be between hardcover. So I, I threw out a couple of stories, and then another, I, I can't even remember, maybe four or five of them, I just did really radical revisions where I would switch narrative perspectives, you know, that a story that was being told from the point of view of one character, I would then tell from the point of view of another, mm -hmm. or, you know, I would take a, a story that was in the first person, the I, did this thing and, the, and then uh, turned it into a third person piece or you know a lot of just radical radical restructuring before I felt comfortable with the with the stories so in, in a way they're, they're almost new stories some of them are yeah yeah I mean th there are a few stories that had already been published that I did such drastic revisions to that it, it was okay to send them out and, and publish them as, as new pieces and how did you start give us a little bit about your background how did you start as a writer and then how did you get into short story writing if you were I think I started, I think I had literary ambitions as early as the first grade, mm -hmm. that I, I wrote a couple of plays that have not endured uh, for, for the first grade. <coughs> and uh, We're not going to see them off broadly. No, 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 no. I, I think those are, those are done. Um, but I, I always had a real appetite for language and for story. I think to some extent I, I owe a debt to my mother, who was a classicist and very into Greek and Roman mythology, and I mm -hmm. sort of grew up on a, on a diet of that. And I think very early in life, I just loved language and I loved storytelling. And then I, I sort of worked my way around to short fiction, I guess, just as the beginner's form. Uh -huh. You know, that uh, you know, sitting down to try to write a novel right out of the gate just didn't seem right. Sure. And it was uh, the short story is a, a nice form to kind of try different narrative approaches. And I think in the book. It's, I really look at it as a kind of apprenticeship at short fiction, that there mm -hmm. are a bunch of different ways to try to skin the cat in there. You know, that there are some stories that are trying to succeed on humor and others that are trying to do things with language or others that are kind of going straight to a, a sort of more earnest emotional core. Um, so it's a lot, a lot of different stuff. It is. It's, I didn't notice a theme. Maybe it's me, but there wasn't any kind of unifying thing other than they were written by Wells Tower. <laughs> right. Yeah, for <laughs> me. Did I miss it? <laughs> is there one thing? No, no, no. I think the theme is uh, the first short stories that, uh, the first nine short stories I wrote in my career that didn't uh, fill me with cold nausea and dread <laughs> when I sat back and looked at them again. Uh, but that's really it. That uh, yeah. you know, and, and you, we hear a lot about how you know if you're going to publish a short story collection, they really need to be linked stories. There mm -hmm. has to be this really tight kind of thematic focus to them. And you know, so for those reasons, I was prepared for this collection to kind of be a critical disaster. That it just sort of didn't 
um, yeah. seem to do the things that short story collections are supposed to do according to the rules of today's market. Um, so you've been surprised by I've the I've been very surprised, yeah. yeah. You mentioned your, your mother as an influence. Was she a writer or your father? No, she, I mean, I, I grew up in a pretty literary household. There were, there were avid readers. My mother uh, is a Latin teacher uh -huh. at a uh, local high school in Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and my father is an economics professor, but they were, they were at, bookish. At North Carolina? Uh, at Duke. At Duke. But they were people who, you know, loved literature and, and loved language and, you know, yeah. made made a point to read to me from, from an early age and, and sold me on, on good stuff, I think, when I was pretty young. So how did you get into the business? You're a full-time writer. You don't teach on the side. This is your, your That's It's what I so, do. Yeah. Um, I really came at it in a weird way. I'd After graduating from college, I kind of bounced around a while and worked a few awful jobs doing, you know, data entry and heavy lifting and, and all sorts of terrible things. Literally and heavy lifting or heavy yeah, lifting? Yeah, 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 doing, doing some heavy lifting. Yeah, I had some where, warehouse gigs out in uh, Portland, Oregon, where I moved right after college. And then I, I went back to North Carolina and really was very eager to find any kind of job where I could just use language. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if I'd found a job doing the in-house newsletter at a toothpaste factory. That that was sort of the dream at, at, at that point. You know, just anything just where I could play with words. Yeah, so. just anything where I'd get to write sentences. But my first kind of entree to legitimate publishing stuff was I, I got a job as as the night watchman or night manager over at the Center for Documentary Studies at, at mm -hmm. Duke University. And at the time, they were publishing this magazine, Double Take, which was a phenomenal, just this beautiful uh, documentary. I remember and, and, yeah, it, beautiful, magazine, yeah. beautifully photographed and, and well-written. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was fantastic. And it's not with us anymore, right? No, right. no, yeah. I, think it's, uh, I think it's finally bitten the dust after sort of hanging on for, yeah. for a few years, which is a great shame. But uh, so I, I got a job just sort of locking up over there and, and watering the plantings and, and that sort of stuff. And I, I managed to ultimately work my way into running their website and doing a little bit of editorial stuff there. And then after the magazine had its funding pulled by Duke, the staff kind of scattered to the, to the four winds and my editor at the magazine went on to the Washington Post magazine. And then when I decided I was going to try to make a go of it writing, I, I pitched a story to him where I went and got a job in a traveling carnival, and, and he took that story, and that was sort of my first major magazine piece in the Washington Post magazine. And, and you still there, do journalism. Kind of yeah. A lot yeah. of it. I, fact, I do, I, a fair amount. Yeah. You, you did one of the um, the early ivory build woodpecker discovery stories. I did. I remember. I about did. Five years ago, right? After yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was... So you've was, been to Arkansas before. I have, yeah. I, I, I came, uh, I think I made two trips out to Brinkley uh, yeah. for, for, that, for that story. We and, haven't uh, seen it again. <laughs> no, I know, and I was I was a, a, a true believer, and so now I guess the, the skeptics have kind of come out of the woodwork and said, oh, maybe it's just this groupthink thing, but I, I still like to believe that the ivory bill is out there in the, in the woods. Let's talk about your short stories a little bit. Um, uh, the words that seem to be used most to describe them are strange, disturbing, <laughs> dark a little bit, but also funny. Uh -huh. uh, I definitely see the strange and, and disturbing and funny. Uh, are those apt descriptions, and how would you describe the, the stories uh, oh, in general? Oh, I don't general? know. Um, I suppose they are strange, though I, I didn't sit down to write a deliberately esoteric batch of short stories. I yeah. think, you know, for me to feel like I'm capable of writing a story, I, I, I really feel as if the story has to take its own place mm -hmm. and sort of, you know, snatch its its existence out of uh, out of the void yeah. and you know carve its own very specific uh, kind of environment. And so I, I suppose if they feel odd or you know if they're they're dealing with with sort of outre subject matter. Uh -huh. um, for me, it's just as a writer, I feel like I need to be writing about something that's that's unfamiliar to me or something that I'm kind of inventing. Well, do you know where you're going when you sit down to write it? Because even as a journalist, sometimes I'm not sure where the story's going to take me, especially a piece of opinion journal. Sure. Uh, or do you have an idea of this is going to be the plot or this is going to be how the story develops or does it just happen? It's a, it's a tough, that's uh, something I'm still trying to figure out. I've, yeah. I've gone at it both ways. and. And I think that when you plot it out too much, there's a real danger that you know you you get too deliberate and you get mm -hmm. too careful in the way you put a story together. That 
I think the most successful stories are the ones where you start with a very small idea, maybe just a sentence or, or a scene or, or a description, mm -hmm. and you, you try to let that whatever the, the sort of initial bit of momentum is that intrigues you about uh, about approaching a story, you try to let that pull you into the bigger place. Yeah. I think when you when you have too much control on the front end, it, you can wind up with something kind of sterile and, and you know, a failure. You mentioned uh, in one case you changed the point of view of the main character. From, I think mm -hmm. it's in the story called Retreat, uh -huh. uh, about two brothers. Uh, one is uh, Fairly successful mm -hmm. and has decided to open this retreat. Where is it? Up in the, up uh, in, in Maine. Maine. Yeah. In Maine. Yep. And invites his other brother, who was kind of a failed musician, to come mm -hmm. up. Originally, it was from the point of view of the younger brother, mm -hmm. who's the musician. Now it's the older brother, sure. correct? Yeah. Um, I've never heard of that before. That's an interesting <laughs> take on, on, a, on a revision. How, how do you uh -huh. do that, and, and did it change the story drastically? Well, I, I think it did. I mean, it, the, that story is, is about a guy who sort of appropriately is a failed uh, real estate developer. Mm -hmm. He's a guy who'd, who'd been very wealthy at, at one point, and he'd had a few investments go wrong, and so his... Uh, his sort of last resort move was to buy this piece of property up in Maine and, and yeah. to go up there and, and he's sort of trying to develop it but he's sort of in, in hot water and and that guy you know he's sort of very sh sure of himself he's, he's a little bit of a blowhard and uh, and so in the first story the younger brother shows up and he's dealing with his his sort of overblown blustery kind of obnoxious older brother and mm -hmm. and when I sat sat down to read it after the manuscript had gone through its initial edits, I just looked at it and thought, you know, here's sort of a snarky narrator who objects to his older brother and you mm -hmm. know, has all these sorts of problems with him and, and uh, just sort of ridicules him in the narrative throughout. Yeah. And, and it's just not all that, that interesting. And I thought it would be a much more interesting story to tell it from the point of view of the character uh, who sort of had very little sympathy on his side in the initial draft, yeah. to tell it from the point of view of the less sympathetic character. To me, it just seemed like a much more kind of morally complex perspective uh, to tell the story from. But there's a version out there of the original retreat. Right. And, uh -huh. there, there, and that, that one ran in McSweeney's, is that it right? It did. Okay. Yeah, and then actually in McSweeney's... read them both side by side. Well, in, uh, my publisher, in fact, published a little kind of chapbook uh, with both versions of the story and then a really? little essay about the, the Who's revision the publisher process. of the book? It's uh, for our Strauss and Giroux. And it is Everything Ravaged, Everything Burned by Wells Tower and we're at the, uh, the Literary Festival uh, where Wells is on the program and visiting with us. Uh, your first book, um, uh, at one point you said you were working on a novel or you're getting, or you're getting ready to crank it back up again? Yeah, yeah that's, up? That's, that's the next phase. I'm, I'm under contract for one. And yeah, so it's, it's an all I've, yeah. I've sort of been toying with over the years, but I'm really looking forward to some unbroken time to, to sit down and, and get into can, it. Can you give us an idea what it's about, just in general? I think it'll just be a big family novel. I think it'll be a big novel novel. <laughs> well, f family, what? Now, there might, that would have been a, a theme for this book. I mean, sure. you had you know, sure. brothers and, and uh, wayward husbands and yeah. uh, fathers and sons. And uh -huh. of course, I guess you can do that in almost every. And even yeah. the, Viking, the Viking story, which we need to talk about, was very family oriented. Absolutely. Well, I, I think that most. I don't know many books that don't take up family as yeah. a preoccupation. You know, it's it's where we come from. It's can all relate to it. Yeah, and, and sure. I think that most of our sort of joys and, and anxieties and all of it can be traced back to, to people that we're related to and you know the people we we get ourselves involved with. Yeah. Let's talk about that Viking story, which is getting a lot of uh, sure. uh, press, uh, and it's the title story to the book. It's uh -huh. the last one in the no in the in the collection, but save it for last. It's it's great. It's totally different from the other ones. I think it's hilarious. It, it kind of remind. It could have been a Saturday Night Live skit, only much more <laughs> elevated. But you have these Vikings who are kind of burned out. They've been doing the rape, rape and pillage thing for a while, right. <laughs> and they've got one last uh, excursion to go on, and they don't don't really want to do it, it and it's just kind of has this um, uh, this element to it a, a very uh, 21st century laid-back middle-aged sure, guy, you know, sure. where, where did that piece come from? It was a funny story for me, I, I, I suppose it it came out of a kind of fatigue with writing more earnest stories where I was, you know, really going for realism yeah. and I, I'd been doing that for, I don't know, maybe a year or so, it's still, it's still a pretty early story for me, the Viking one. 
And I'd been talking with a friend of mine. There's, there's a, a really horrible thing that happens in that story, this act of violence, the, the blood eagle, which is too gruesome to describe yeah, uh, for a broadcast audience. Yeah, was that an actual audience. Viking? Yeah, that was, that was an actual Viking thing, and it's this, this yeah. really grotesque procedure that Vikings would, would do to their victims. And, uh, and I was talking with a friend of mine about it, and we were just saying, man, you know, if we were Vikings, would you ever have the time or inclination to do this? You know, I'm just way too lazy to, to, <laughs> yeah, to want to Yeah, because it's a pretty this. precise Yeah, it, it, takes, a, it takes a lot yeah. of work. That, uh, and, and we were saying, yeah, I think if we were Vikings, we'd just say, man, you know, let's just skip the Blood Eagle and go have a beer somewhere. <laughs> and, and so this idea occurred to me to try to write a kind of a kind of a gag story, yeah. essentially do a, a kind of uh, blue collar, gritty realist kind of short story, like like a Raymond Carver story or a Richard Ford short story, but set it in, in this mm -hmm. Viking siege. And just to have fun with that kind of, uh, that sort of macho literary conceit and these, these sort of downtrodden, beleaguered but it also has a real kind of sweet family yeah, element. Yeah, and, and it, you know that that, yeah. that for me was the the gratifying thing about it. I mean, I think with a short story, you're trying to will yourself into this state of hypnosis where you you believe in the world that mm -hmm. you're making up. And mm -hmm. and the story that had started for me kind of is, you know, maybe a bit of a cynical joke, wound up drawing me into this much bigger, much more tender space. Yeah. And I, I wish that could happen with every story, but it's. Uh, you know, it's it's nice when you when you kind of lose control of your intention a little bit with, with a piece of short fiction. Now, when you chose the stories, and you and you uh, were speaking with your editor at Farrar Strauss, did they know you were going to revise them so much? And was there a, a, a dispute about that? Did they said, "No, leave them, leave them alone." Go. They were they were very patient. Uh, I think by the end, I was starting to maybe scare them a little bit. <laughs> Just because I couldn't stop revising, and I think I got into a place where I was revising less out of any kind of sane editorial intelligence and more this you just, just sort of quit yeah, paper. just this sort of frenzied yeah. impulse to want to be a, a better writer than than I am, yeah. and just to sort of you know, do as much as I possibly could with the stories, and and also just not feeling comfortable with the idea that they would ever be resolved to a final draft that I have to be committed. Some to. Some of these date back. Eight years or so. Yeah, you yeah, know, and, so. and I'll look at some of my stuff. It's not in this league, believe me. But I'll say, my, a lot of times I'll think, what was I thinking? That's, this has holes all in it. It's horrible. Sure. Uh, some of it I surprised myself. <laughs> but was that that must have been an in interesting experience well, that, to look that, back it, at it, yourself as, a, as an early. That writer. was intriguing. I mean, it was. It actually took me a while before I could even look at the pages when they'd come back from the editor, uh -huh. just because I, I hadn't even read those old stories when my agent sent them out to publishers. Mm -hmm. And I was so afraid that I was going to be disgusted by the early work uh -huh. that it took me a while to even crack into it. But it, it was interesting, actually, looking back at those early stories, because I found that there was something kind of brave and simple in the way that I'd, I'd approach those stories. I think. You know, fiction is a real high wire act, and as soon as you look down and you're, you know, aware of the risks in making up your own little world and, and, and set of mm -hmm. characters and how badly it can fail, uh, you know, then you get afraid and and you can often get blocked. But mm -hmm. you know, when I first started writing, it just I, I wasn't really aware of all the perils, and I would just sort of charge into the breach sure. and, and, and tell a story. Any yeah, just going after. It. And yeah. sure, there were some clumsy things in, in the early stories, but there was also a kind of braveness about them yeah. that, that I, I kind of admired and would like to work back to. Well, you, you told me on the phone earlier that uh, a couple of the stories were unsolicited. You sent them to the Paris Review mm -hmm. and they're yeah. for their slush pile, I sure. guess, which is what they get when they don't ask for it. And they accepted both. Mm -hmm. uh, and you had a conversation with George Plimpton, which was... I the did. Tell, I tell did. me a little bit about that experience. Oh, well. How old were you at the time? Oh, maybe 20... 27 or so, yeah. 27, 28. But yeah, th those were really the first two short stories that I wrote. And uh, Are they in the book? They are. <clears throat> yeah, The Brown Coast and, and Down Through the Valley. And, you know, I just sort of sent them out thinking that, you know, I'd never hear back. Sure. And I got a few rejections. And then, I don't know, maybe four or five months later, I got this call from the Paris Review. And they said they liked the stories, and uh -huh. you know we went over some preliminaries about when it was going to get published. And they yeah. said, uh, you know, now we're going to patch you through to George. He's got some comments. And I thought, oh, 
well, yeah, not not George Plimpton. You know, this is a guy who I'd, I'd George, yeah, you know, I'd read and admired for so long, and he was really, you know, I, I've done a little bit of, of kind of participatory journalism, uh -huh. uh, really just inspired by by Plimpton, by Plimpton and no one else. Didn't that inspire your Carney <laughs> story initially? With yeah, the Washington yeah, yeah, absolutely. And the submersion journalism, yeah, I guess it's now called, but right. Plimpton was doing it twenty years, he was, and thirty he years was, ago. And, and sure. he, I mean. Uh, you know, he was on my short list of, I don't know, five or six writers, yeah. five or six living writers who I most admired. And, yeah. and uh, so I, I was, got put on the phone with him, and he had gone through the story and read it very closely and, and really was, you know, wanting to talk about how to restructure little metaphors and, you know, put periods here or there. So he had his hands in there. That's he really great. did. It astonished me. I yeah. had no idea that he was still uh, engaged that way, particularly with the work of completely unknown writers. That's you good. Know, so that was, that was a real, uh, that was a great moment for me. Um, let's talk a little bit about the short story. There's been some talk, mainly because of your book, that there's a short story renaissance. Uh, we've, we had the uh, biography of John Cheever out sure. now, uh, one of Flannery O'Connor, at least one, maybe two. Yeah. Um, Donald Barthelme thing. That's so, right. Yeah. And uh, this idea that there's a revival of the short story, that people are are getting more interested or getting back to the short story instead of the novel. What, what are your thoughts on that? I think you would have to pose that question to somebody who hasn't been reading short stories all along. Yeah. You know, that for me, I've, I've always loved the form uh -huh. and I find it so challenging and rigorous and, and wonderful. You know, I, I've been reading them voraciously, you know, ever since I've started reading. Yeah. Uh, I certainly hope there's a revival. I, I think it's, I think it's a great form and I think in a lot of ways, it's. I think the American literary tradition has contributed a great deal to the short story. Mm -hmm. I think some of our short story writers, you know, Richard Yates, John Cheever, Flannery O'Connor, uh, you know, Scott Fitzgerald's short fiction, uh, you know, Raymond Carver, Tobias Wolfe. I, I think we've done phenomenal things with with the short story, and yeah. I, I wish that more of us would sort of take it up and be, be proud of our, our tradition. Were those some uh, influences or some uh, Sure, uh, all know, of those inspirations? people. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Cheever and, and, mm -hmm. and Yates. Yeah, very much so. And it's, yeah, it's great to see people reading Cheever again and, and Yates getting a little bump after From uh, the Revolutionary Road. Yeah. yeah, so. Uh, we, you know, we were talking earlier about some of the nonfiction you've done. You're a working journalist, right, for, mm -hmm. uh, off the top of my head, Harper's, Washington Post Magazine, The Oxford American mm -hmm. here in Arkansas. Sure. Uh, Garden and Gun, mm -hmm. a variety, um, outside magazine. Mm -hmm. uh, so you do both. What, what is, uh, which do you like better? What you, how's the, uh, how does it compare working on fiction and nonfiction? Well, they're, they're two very different animals. I think nonfiction is, uh, I think it's a much less fraught medium for me. Mm -hmm. You know, that it's, it's it's difficult, but the the process is fairly simple. You go out and do some reporting and jot a few things in your notebook and, and do a few interviews, and then you look at what you got and you type it up into scenes, and then you string them together in some way, and then bang, you've got a, a magazine piece. Yeah. Hopefully, the editor likes it. And Hopefully, the editor likes it, and, and you know, and you've got the editor looking over your shoulder the sure. whole time, and and so you know, once your editor's satisfied, you're 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 off the clock. Yeah. Um, with fiction, it's so much more difficult that it's. You know, in nonfiction, you kind of can coldly assemble a string of, of different scenes and elements, and, and then you've got a, a magazine story. With fiction, I think it all has to be born of a kind of unified intention. And I think there's something much subtler and, and more organic about mm -hmm. the way a piece of fiction has to germinate and, and build and, and claim its space and conclude that, uh, you know, it's, it's just a much it's a much more fickle, delicate creature to try to bring into the world. How long does it take you to write a short story? And does that vary? It's getting longer and longer. <laughs> <laughs> really? when, I, when I first started writing, I could write a short story in, I don't know, eight days. Yeah. Uh, wow. Now it might take me six months to write a short story. And I, I don't know why that is. <laughs> But maybe it's the it's it's the wily e. coyote thing that, that uh, yeah more and more I, I, I look down. That's so do you see a point in your career where you are just doing the fiction, the short stories, and, and novel writing, and giving up the nonfiction, or do you do you think you'll do both as long as I'd, you can? I'd hate to give up the nonfiction. That yeah. there's there's something wonderful about being able to parachute into other people's lives and and to spend time with them and really to try to Absolutely. get inside their heads sure. and see yeah. how they, they it is kind of a world. privilege isn't it it's a terrific privilege yeah. 
And I, yeah, I'd, I'd hate to give that up at any point. Um, well, if you would, before we finish off, would you read a passage from your book? Sure, uh, I'd be glad to. And, and I, I, before we, we came on air, I insisted on the Viking story, which is uh -huh. great. So. Sure, let me uh, dig this up. <clears throat> So this is the final paragraph of this Viking story we've been talking about, uh -huh. and what's happening here is these guys who have gone out and done some terrible raiding o over the arc of the story have finally gotten back to their homeland where they're all settling into a more kind of domestic situation, and the narrator who has committed some awful violences in the, in the preceding pages is now starting a family and, and, and dealing with that. So this is the final paragraph of everything ravaged, everything burned. After Pila and me had our little twins, and we put a family together, I got an understanding of how terrible love can be. You wish you hated those people, your wife and children, because you know the things the world will do to them, because you have done some of those things yourself. It's crazy making, yet you cling to them with everything and close your eyes against the rest of it. But still, you wake up late at night and lie there listening for the creak and splash of oars, the clank of steel, the sounds of men rowing towards your home. That's not a bad summation of the whole collection. It's not. I, I think that that's why we, uh, it seemed like a good note to go out yeah. on, that it's sort of about embattled, this embattled quest for, for safe harbor. Wells, thanks a lot for uh, taking your time, and congratulations on the book. It's doing great, so well, hopefully you, we'll Katie. see more from you in the future. hope so. It's been a pleasure. Wells Tower, again, the book is Everything Ravaged, Everything Burned, his first collection of stories, and uh, I have a feeling it won't be the last. Thanks, Wells. <laughs> Thank you. All right.